Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. This week we are looking at unusual and weird true crime cases. Over to our first story. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Lawrence Joseph Bader and John Johnson, who was more commonly known as Fritz. Lawrence was born in Akron, Ohio, on the 2nd of December 1926. He was one of at least five children born to Stephen and Charlotte Bader. In 1944, Lawrence dropped out of high school in order to join the Navy. Returning from service in 1946, he completed his high school education and then enrolled at the University of Akron. Here, he met his future wife, a lady by the name of Mary Lou Knapp. After just one term at the University of Akron, he dropped out and began working at a local restaurant. Several years later, on the 19th of April 1952, Lawrence and Mary Lou got married and they moved to a small bungalow in the West Hills neighbourhood of Akron. Over the next five years, they had three children together, Mary, Lawrence Jr and Stephen. In May 1957, Mary Lou was five months pregnant with their fourth child. By this time, Lawrence was working for Lifetime Distributors as a kitchenware salesman. On the 15th of May 1957, Lawrence needed to visit Cleveland on business. He packed his fishing gear and a small case into the car and told Mary Lou that he planned to go fishing after his meetings were completed. Mary Lou suggested that he should come straight home instead as the weather was forecast to get worse later that day, to which Lawrence replied, maybe I will and maybe I won't. He left home at around midday and, before making the 40 mile journey to Cleveland, he cashed a cheque for $400 and then paid some bills, including his insurance premium. Once his business was completed, Lawrence drove to Eddie's Boathouse on the Rocky River near Lake Erie. Here he met the owner, Lawrence Coatler, and asked to rent a fishing boat. The owner was concerned that weather conditions were expected to be rough later in the day, but Lawrence was adamant that he wanted to rent the boat. Paying a $15 deposit, Lawrence rented a 14-foot fishing boat with a small outboard motor. A short time into his fishing trip, the Coast Guard saw Lawrence and again warned him of the impending storm. Lawrence reassured the Coast Guard that he was okay and went on his way. Not long afterwards, a storm hit the area. The following morning, 16th of May 1957, Lawrence's boat was found approximately five miles down the shore from the boatyard on the rocks at Perkins Beach in Lakewood. The boat had sustained minor damage and inside was one oar, an empty gas canister, life vests and fishing gear. There was no sign of Lawrence. A search and investigation followed. It was established that the boat had not capsized and the assumption was made that Lawrence had been swept off of the boat by a large wave during the storm. Despite Lawrence being a strong swimmer, the Coast Guard stated that at the time of Lawrence's disappearance, the lake was so rough that no one could have survived if swept overboard. The search for Lawrence was eventually called off and, at his wife's request, he was declared dead in 1960. John Johnson, who was more commonly known as Fritz, was born in 1926. He never knew his biological parents, being one of 22 babies found on doorsteps in Boston that year. All of the male babies were given the same name, John Johnson. They were then given a different nickname, which was how he became known as Fritz. Fritz joined the Navy when he was 17 years old and served in both World War II and the Korean War. He was hospitalised for a back injury and as a result of this was discharged from the army in early 1957. In May that year, Fritz was hired as a bartender by Ross's Steakhouse in Omaha, Nebraska. He had a larger than life character and was popular with the patrons from day one. He was flamboyant and unconventional 
and soon became well known within the local community. Before long, he had secured a job as a DJ at the local radio station before moving on to become a presenter at the local news channel. Popular, upbeat and fun, Fritz had a pencil moustache and was often seen wearing a leather beret. He was known for his elaborate champagne parties that were hosted in his apartment, which did not have furniture but instead floors covered with pillows. Fritz had many eccentricities, including a strange habit of dating his checks by season rather than the day, month and year. In order to raise awareness for a polio drive, he completed a publicity stunt where he sat in a box on top of a 50-foot flagpole for 30 days. During this time, he arranged for friends to send martinis in milk bottles up to the top of the flagpole. This seemed to solidify his popularity and people's affection for his quirky character. Despite always speaking openly about his dislike of marriage, in 1961, at the age of 35, Fritz married a 20-year-old model by the name of Nancy Zimmer. Nancy had a daughter from her previous marriage, who Fritz adopted. Two years later, in 1963, they had a son together. The year after his son's birth, Fritz was treated for a cancerous tumour behind his left eye. He underwent surgery to remove the tumour, which left him needing to wear an eye patch, something which he adopted in his usual flamboyant style. On the 2nd of February 1965, Fritz attended an archery tournament in Chicago, nearly 500 miles away from his home in Omaha. Whilst demonstrating archery equipment, Fritz was spotted by a man from Akron, Ohio, who noticed that Fritz had a striking resemblance to an Akron man who had died in a boating accident eight years earlier, Lawrence Barder. The man knew that Lawrence's niece, Suzanne Pika, lived nearby and asked her to meet him at the archery tournament. When Suzanne arrived, she was shocked by Fritz's likeness to her uncle. Despite the moustache and eye patch, the resemblance was uncanny. Suzanne approached Fritz, who laughed it off and said that he had never heard of Lawrence Bader. However, Suzanne was so convinced that Fritz was her uncle that she contacted Lawrence's brothers, John and Dick. They both lived over 350 miles away in Akron. The brothers quickly made their way to Chicago and were also convinced that the man standing in front of them was, in fact, their dead brother, Lawrence. Despite having no idea who Lawrence was, Fritz agreed to have his fingerprints taken so that the brothers could compare them with those held on Lawrence's military records and find peace in the fact that he wasn't their brother. However, the following day, the fingerprints were confirmed as a match. John Fritz Johnson and Lawrence Joseph Bader were the same person. The lives of both Lawrence and Fritz's wives were immediately turned upside down. Mary Lou had mourned the loss of her husband and helped her children come to terms with the loss of their father. She had been receiving monthly social security payments of around $250 and had received a life insurance payout. This payout was the one which Lawrence had paid the premium for on the day that he went missing. Mary Lou now faced the prospect of having to repay this. She had slowly begun to rebuild her life and had fallen in love again and was engaged to be married. However, she now found that she was still legally married to Lawrence and, because of her Catholic faith, unable to divorce, leaving her new relationship in tatters. Fritz's second wife, Nancy, found her marriage annulled and despite initially stating that she would be standing by her husband, they separated soon after from the strain of dealing with these events. Fritz was quoted as saying that he felt physical shock as though he had been hit in the face when he heard the result of the fingerprint comparison. He stated that he had no recollection of his life as Lawrence and was now faced with the fact that his memories of his life as Fritz were not true. Questions were soon asked as to whether Fritz had suffered from a rare and unusual case of amnesia or if this was all an elaborate hoax by a man who wanted a new life. 
he was assessed at length by a team of psychiatrists who concluded that they believed that he had no recollection of his previous life but they also could not find any psychological reason which would explain his memory loss. Questions remained as to whether Fritz would be prosecuted for both fraud and bigamy. With these questions hanging over him, Fritz was fired by his job at the TV station and had to return to bar work to earn money. Now with two families, including six children to support, he struggled to make ends meet. Lawrence Kotler, the owner of the boat from which Lawrence disappeared, came looking for compensation for his damaged boat and Fritz ended up living at the Omaha YMCA. In order for Fritz to be prosecuted, it would need to be established that his acts were deliberate. On one hand, Fritz was consistent and clear in the fact that he had no recollection of his previous life and in August 1965, when he met with Mary Lou and their four children, the youngest of which he had never met, he was adamant that they were all strangers to him. Psychologists stated that cases of amnesia where a person fills in time with false memories, whilst rare, were certainly possible and he could have sustained an injury during the storm that night. It was also suggested that the tumour which he had removed in 1964 could have been responsible for his memory loss. However, on the other hand, it was also established at the time of Lawrence's disappearance that he was over $20,000 in debt and was also in trouble with the IRS for not filing tax returns from 1951 through to 1957. The complete contrast between his two different lifestyles may have hinted at someone who felt trapped in his life and was desperate for a way out. Opinion was and remains divided as to what really happened. Before any investigation was concluded, Fritz died from liver cancer on the 16th of September 1966 at St. Joseph's Medical Hospital in Omaha. He was just 39 years old. A service was held for Fritz at the First Methodist Church in Omaha and then the following day his body was transported to Akron so that Lawrence could be buried in a family plot at the Holy Cross Cemetery. He was never prosecuted for any crime, if indeed any crime did occur. I would be really interested to hear your opinions on Fritz's innocence or guilt in the comment section below. That concludes today's story. Thank you very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. I always try to avoid sensationalising any aspects of the crime and research deeply to ensure that I give as accurate and as fair an account of events as possible, which is why I found this week's crime particularly interesting. The crime itself, a horrific murder about which there seemed to be very little information available either online or in the press. However, some 40 years later, a film was made about the crime, a black comedy in which our narrator and protagonist is the murderer themselves. But first, the details of the crime. 46-year-old Alfred Benning married his second wife, 43-year-old Elizabeth, in 1957. It was also Elizabeth's second marriage, and at least at first, seemed to be a happy one for them both. They lived together in Standon Street, a residential street near the Karori Cemetery on the outskirts of Wellington, New Zealand. Alfred was a quiet, unassuming man who worked as an SPCA, Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, inspector prior to his retirement. Elizabeth was an upstanding religious woman who was involved with the Karori Presbyterian Church. Over the years, their relationship declined to such a point where the couple lived separate lives and barely spoke. The house was pretty much divided into two halves so the pair could avoid each other as much as possible. Alfred lived in one half with his tiny Dutch, Kaishund, who he adored whilst Elizabeth lived in the other half next to the man and dog who she hated. By 1977, Elizabeth had instructed a lawyer who was pursuing Alfred for joint ownership of their house in Standon Street and also to gain a greater weekly allowance for Elizabeth. 
It was in the summer of that year that Elizabeth had expressed concern to her friends that her husband was up to something and that they might not see her again. Now retired from his job as an SPCA inspector, Alfred had another job where he euthanised animals in the basement of his home and had made a sort of gas chamber under their house. Elizabeth was frightened that he may put her in it. By the September of 1977, Elizabeth had gone to Canada to help her sister who had been involved in a serious car accident. At least that was the story that Alfred told. Meanwhile, Alfred carried on with his life. On the 13th of September, Alfred asked his neighbour, Jesse Earp, the crematorium manager in Karori, if he could borrow the cemetery's wheelbarrow for a job that he was completing. Jesse, who was reluctant to lend out company property, said that he could not, instead offering Alfred the use of his own wheelbarrow. Alfred refused, stating that it would not be big enough for the job which he had in mind. Over the following days, Alfred was seen in the company of sex workers and, within a week of his wife's trip to Canada, had hired one of these women to be his housekeeper. However, this woman became suspicious of Alfred's strange behaviour and reported this to the police. Similarly, Elizabeth's friends were also concerned for her welfare and had contacted the authorities. When the police arrived at Alfred's house on the 23rd of September, they found him using an outdoor incinerator. He advised them to stay away from the area as the ground was particularly muddy. When asked about his wife, Alfred said that, All I can say is that you would not meet a better woman, always nice and always kept the house nice. As the conversation went on, the police began to notice how Alfred referred to Elizabeth in the past tense. Further investigation uncovered a freshly planted apple tree in the garden with a large pile of soil next to it. Buried under the tree, the police found Elizabeth's body, cut into six pieces and neatly wrapped in newspaper. A denture plate and metal from a corset were found in amongst the ashes in the incinerator. Alfred was arrested and charged with his wife's murder. A trial... Alfred claimed that he was not guilty of murder and that he had acted in self-defence. He explained how on the evening of the 12th of September, Elizabeth had rushed into the lounge with a carving knife in her hand. She was both suicidal and threatening towards Alfred's beloved dog. A fight broke out during which Alfred kicked Elizabeth in the stomach and then strangled her with the cord from a sash window. He went on to state that when he realised that he had killed his wife, he went into total shock, walking around aimlessly before collapsing into a chair. The following morning, realising that he was in serious trouble, he decided that he needed to get rid of Elizabeth's body. He tried to lift her, but was simply not strong enough, so instead he dragged her body to their laundry room, where he proceeded to cut her up with a meat chopper. Even though Alfred thoroughly cleaned up all of the blood, the police were able to find traces of Elizabeth's blood on the floorboards under the lino flooring. Despite finding seven library books, five of which were about murders on his bedside table, coupled with his actions following the murder of his wife, his lawyer, Mike Bungay, argued that the killing was unplanned and Alfred was purely acting in self-defence, stating, If he carefully planned this, he did a very bad job. Surely, if you had got an interest in this subject... If you were planning a murder, would you really bury the wife in the back garden? Anybody would know that that would be the first place the police would go to search, with a freshly planted apple tree to mark the spot. However, the jury were having none of it. After just three hours of deliberation, they found Alfred guilty of murder and he was jailed for life. He never showed any regret for his wife's brutal murder and died in prison in 1996. In all likelihood, the memory of this couple would have faded into obscurity had it not been for a TV movie made in 2015. Described on IMDb as a melodramatic black comedy presenting the true story of Alfred Benning's murder of his wife, Betty, in 1970s Wellington. The film follows a passive-aggressive man, 
Simon O'Connor, spiralling towards psychosis as his emotionally abusive wife, Geraldine Brophy, threatens to cast his beloved dog out of the house. He has an IMDb rating of 6.5 out of 10 and 4.5 stars on Amazon Prime. I've watched this film, and whilst I did enjoy many elements of the dark humour contained in it, it did leave me with some pertinent questions. At what point is it okay to turn a true life murder into a comedy? Always? After a certain amount of time has passed? Or never? Should a film, even a comedy, intentionally evoke sympathy for a real life murderer and portray the victim as someone who was so annoying that she basically had it coming? I've spoken to some of my fellow YouTube true crimers about this and it led to some really interesting debates and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section down below. That concludes today's story. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. If you're looking to watch this TV film, I watch this on STV Player, but I also believe it may be on FreeV as well. Goodbye. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be returning to Texas in the 1990s to look at the unusual case of Cowboy Bob. In May 1991, at the American Federal Bank in Irvine, Texas, a man walked in wearing a brown leather jacket, cowboy boots and a cowboy hat. His hair was starting to turn grey and he had a full beard. He was standing around 5 feet 10 inches tall and estimated to be in his mid-40s. There was very little to distinguish him from thousands of other bank customers in Texas at the time. However, this man was at the bank that day to commit a robbery. He kept his head down to avoid his face being caught on camera. He then approached the cashier and simply handed them a note stating, This is a bank robbery. Give me your money. No marked bills or die packs. The man was calm and collected and did not utter a single word. He checked the money for die packs and left the bank within minutes after he had arrived. As bank robbery is a federal crime, the FBI were called in to investigate. They discovered that the robber made his escape in a 1975 Orange Pontiac Grand Prix, but they soon realised that the licence plate was stolen. With no leads to follow, the investigation stalled. Seven months later, in December 1991, the same man parked his Orange Pontiac directly in front of the Savings of America Bank in Irvine and calmly walked inside. Once again, he demanded cash by handing the cashier a note and left again within minutes, this time approximately $1,200 richer. As the FBI followed up on the license plate of the Pontiac, they arrived at a house to find a startled lady sitting in her home, having no idea that her license plate from her red Chevrolet had been stolen earlier that day. The bank robber became known as Cowboy Bob, and other than the fact that he wore his cowboy hat backwards, the FBI had learnt nothing new about him since the first robbery. The following month, in January 1992, Cowboy Bob struck again. Parking directly outside of the Texas Heritage Bank in Garland, Texas, he stole several thousand dollars from the bank in a few minutes. Once again, the Pontiac had a stolen license plate and the investigation led nowhere. Steve Powell, a 20-year veteran of the FBI who specialised in catching bank robbers, was stumped. He was no closer to discovering the identity of Cowboy Bob. During every robbery, Cowboy Bob was meticulous in checking for die packs, was calm, never spoke, and gave nothing away that could help in identifying him. In May 1992, Cowboy Bob approached the nation's bank in Mesquite, Texas. Carefully checking the money as it was handed over, he gave back the notes containing the die packs to the cashier, before once again making a speedy exit this time with over $5,000 in cash. After a break of around five months, Cowboy Bob approached the first Gibraltar bank in Mesquite and got away with just under $2,000.
While the FBI were at the bank investigating this robbery, they received a call. Another robbery had already taken place, this time at the first interstate bank in Mesquite. When the cashier handed over the money, almost $14,000, a huge haul for Cowboy Bob, he tipped his hat to them before making his escape. Once again, the FBI tracked the license plate on the getaway car, but on this occasion they were shocked to find that the plate matched the description of the car for the first time. Could it be that in his haste to commit two robberies in the same day, Cowboy Bob had finally made a mistake? The Orange Pontiac Grand Prix was registered to a man by the name of Pete Tallis. 52-year-old Pete worked at a Ford auto parts factory nearby. The FBI rushed to find Pete, believing that they had finally got their man. When interviewed, Pete confirmed that he did in fact own the Pontiac, but that he had given it to his mother, Helen, and sister, Peggy Jo, a year or so earlier, as the two women were unable to afford a car of their own. Pete gave his mother and sister's address to the FBI. When they arrived at the address in Garland, Texas, the FBI found the Pontiac complete with the license plate used in the last robbery. It was parked in the car park at the apartment complex. As they were about to approach the apartment where Helen and Peggy Jo lived, a lady dressed in shorts and a t-shirt got into the Pontiac and drove out of the car park. Assuming that Cowboy Bob was still inside the apartment, some FBI agents followed this woman and pulled her over once they were out of sight. The lady identified herself as 48-year-old Peggy Jo Tallis. Peggy Jo told the FBI that she had taken the car out that morning to buy some fertilizer from a nursery and that she was the only one who had driven it. She also confirmed that the only person in the apartment at that time was her mother who was quite unwell. The agents repeatedly questioned Peggy Jo about whether she had a boyfriend or a friend who had access to the car, but she continued to tell them that she was the only one who drove it. They kept asking who she was protecting, but she continued to deny this. As the FBI performed a search of the apartment, they found the hat and jacket that had been worn during the robberies along with the firearm. They also found approximately $15,000 in cash and a fake beard. As the FBI agent, Steve Powell, continued to question Peggy Jo, he noticed white flakes starting to fall from her hair and a slight mark on her top lip. At that point, he realized that Cowboy Bob was actually a woman and was in fact Peggy Jo. She was arrested and charged with bank robbery. Peggy Jo was 48 years old, having been born on the 6th of June 1944. She was the youngest of three children born to Pete and Helen Fay Tallis. Her father, Pete, died of cancer when she was just five years old, and she grew up with her mother and siblings in a small rented house in the suburb of Grand Prairie, Texas. Peggy Jo did not do well in school and dropped out of high school after the 10th grade. However, she was popular and kind and had many friends. In her 20s, she moved to a small apartment and worked as a hotel receptionist at a Marriott Hotel in Texas. She had a great social life and would often be seen out and about in the bars and clubs in Dallas. She enjoyed life to the fullest, but also had a bit of a wild side. In the 1970s, she received five years probation for stealing a car during a night out. Peggy Jo never really cared about or was driven by money. She simply wanted enough to get by and dreamed of saving enough to live on a beach in Mexico. After having her heart broken by a man who she fell in love with and then discovered that he was married, she became wary of men and never really aspired to get married or have children. However, as the years passed, her dreams of Mexico and a life without responsibilities faded as her mother's degenerative bone disease and dependence upon her increased. It is believed that it was the cost of her mother's medicines which led Peggy Jo to commit her first bank robbery.
although she never discussed her motives when she was questioned. Some who interviewed her during this time believe that whilst the cost of the medicine may have been her initial motivation, she subsequently became hooked on the thrill of robbing banks. Peggy Jo pleaded guilty and received a relatively lenient sentence of 33 months in federal prison. Perhaps this was because she never used any weapons during the robberies. Despite receiving lucrative book and film offers, she never told her story. Once she was released from prison, she moved, along with her mother, to a two-bedroom townhome in Garland, where she lived an anonymous life taking care of her mother. Peggy Jo got a job at a small marina complex nearby, where she was well-liked, respected and made lots of friends. On the 18th of December 2002, her mother Helen died in her sleep at the age of 83. Her mother's death had a profound effect on Peggy Jo. She bought a recreational vehicle, or RV, sold the majority of her possessions, quit her job at the marina and decided that she would spend her life on the road. Less than two years later, in 2004, either for financial reasons or because she was once again craving the thrill, Peggy Jo is believed to have dressed as a man and robbed a bank in Tyler, East Texas. Just seven months later, on the 5th of May 2005, she returned to that same bank in order to rob it once again. This time, she parked her RV across the street from the bank and at around 11am walked inside. She had not donned her usual cowboy disguise, instead wearing all black with a straw hat and black gloves. Rather than handing over a note, she politely told the teller to hand over everything in their cash drawer. This was a total of around $11,000. Perhaps due to the size of the hall, or because she was out of practice, she forgot to check for dye packs, and as she left the bank, a dye pack hidden in the money exploded. There was red smoke and dye everywhere, and many witnesses saw what had happened. Peggy Jo ran across the seven lane road towards her RV to attempt to escape. By this time, the robbery had already been reported multiple times, and the police were on their way. The old RV did not make for a quick getaway vehicle, and a low-speed pursuit followed, before Peggy Jo was boxed in by the police in a quiet housing estate just a few miles from the bank which she had robbed. The police were unaware of who or how many people were in the RV, so surrounded the vehicle with their weapons drawn. Meanwhile, Peggy Jo left the driver's seat and went into the back of the RV, drew the curtains before sitting at the small table and smoking a cigarette. The police called for her to leave the RV and hand herself in. Peggy Jo opened the back door of the RV and told them that she would not be going back to prison. Despite the police's best efforts to calmly resolve the situation, as she exited the vehicle, Peggy Jo raised a gun and four policemen simultaneously fired at her. She was killed instantly. Despite a loaded gun being found inside the RV, the weapon that Peggy Jo had pointed at the police was in fact a toy pistol. She never had any intention of anyone being physically hurt that day, other than herself. That concludes today's story about Peggy Jo Tallis also known as Cowboy Bob. Please remember to add any comments down below. I'll be interested in reading your thoughts on this case. This is the first recording since hitting the 50,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for your support, everybody. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Peter Fell from Lancashire, which is in the northwest of England. Peter Allen Fell was born in 1961. He was the first child of Allen and Maureen Fell. Allen and Maureen had a difficult relationship and their marriage ended in divorce in 1965. At that time, four-year-old Peter and his younger brother, Paul, were put into care. After a short spell living with foster parents, the two boys were sent to live in a foster home in Weymouth on the southern coast of England. 
some 300 miles from where they had previously lived. Several years later, when Peter was 10 years old, he was once again rehomed. Together with his brother Paul, he was sent back to Lancashire to live at the Blake Gardens Children's Home before another move led to him being placed with foster parents. The two brothers attended the Norden High School in Rishton, Lancashire, where Peter was remembered to be a lonely child who seemed to be crying out for attention. At the age of 16, Peter left school and joined the Royal Transport Corps. During his time in the army, he would often exaggerate and lie about events, including twice claiming to have been attacked by civilians, and he was eventually thrown out after a review by disciplinary officers. On Monday the 10th of May 1982, it was a cold day for the time of year. Sometime before 3pm, 45-year-old Anne Lee left her home in Highfield Gardens, Aldershot, with her black Labrador, Monty, Walking the short distance to Highfield Avenue, she called upon her friend, 66-year-old Margaret Johnson. Margaret, together with her red setter, Tara, joined Anne on her walk. The two women regularly walked their dogs together around nearby Aldershot Common. At around 3.15pm, a third lady was also out walking her dog. As she approached the area known as Hungry Hill, she came across the bodies of Anne and Margaret. They had both been stabbed multiple times. Their bodies had been left around 100 metres from the busy A325 road between Aldershot and Farnham. This was also in close proximity to an army building. They had been brutally stabbed to death in broad daylight. Their dogs, Monty and Tara, were wandering helplessly nearby. Both Anne and Margaret were fully dressed in their jackets, trousers and boots. Additionally, they were both still wearing their jewellery. Both a sexual motive and theft were soon ruled out by the investigating team. Both women were married with children, and in Margaret's case, grandchildren as well. They had been friends for years and often walked their dogs together. They lived a quiet life and their murders came as a huge shock to the local community. The autopsy revealed that Margaret had been stabbed 11 times and Anne 5 times in a brutal and seemingly motiveless attack. There were no witnesses to the crime and any sightings of people who were in the area at the time were soon ruled to be irrelevant to the inquiry. A photo fit was circulated of a man who had been seen in the vicinity who the police were unable to locate, but this again led nowhere. Over a hundred officers became involved in the case, conducting a massive search of the surrounding woodland in the hope of finding the murder weapon, but without success. The day after the attack, Peter was in a pub in the Aldershot area. After leaving the pub, and having clearly consumed a significant amount of alcohol, Peter made a call to the police. The call was not recorded, but the details were noted down. Peter stated that he had met a man in the pub that evening, and that man had got very drunk and had started to talk to him about the murders. Peter went on to say that the man kept saying how sorry he was that he had done it. Peter said the man lived at 10 York Road in Aldershot, his own address. When the police did not visit Peter as a result of his call, he phoned again late the following evening. Again he had been drinking heavily and repeated the information that he had given the previous day. However, Peter was not interviewed in regard to either of these calls at this time. One week after the murders, on the 17th of May 1982, Margaret and Anne's dogs were used in a reconstruction of the events of the previous Monday afternoon, and whilst this led to more information, unfortunately this information did not lead to an arrest. Following this, on the 19th of May 1982, the police began making house-to-house -house inquiries in the area. During this time, Peter was interviewed along with many other residents 
and he was asked to provide some answers to a standard set of questions regarding his whereabouts on the 10th of May. Peter stated that he had been to the bank and had then gone to work. He was ruled out as a suspect. The case continued with little progress. Later that year, Peter moved to Bournemouth where he married a lady by the name of Anne and they were soon expecting their first child. The marriage was short-lived and it is believed that the couple had separated before the birth of their baby, a daughter named Sarah. Peter, who was by now working as a hospital porter, was once again drinking heavily and, in the summer of 1983, he made a series of calls to the Bournemouth Police Department. These calls were made late in the evening and he was clearly drunk when making them. He identified himself as Peter and gave his address. He confessed to the double murder once again, but stated the date of the murders incorrectly. Shortly after, Peter was arrested and taken to Farnborough Police Station for questioning. It has been reported that he was held for 72 hours without access to a solicitor, despite repeated requests for one. Over the course of these three days, there were multiple interviews and despite being offered food, Peter refused to eat. Initially, he denied any involvement in the murders, stating that he had made the phone calls because he wanted to be somebody and was bored and lonely. The interviews continued and he later went on to make a partial confession saying that he'd met the two women and struck one of them with his fists because she reminded him of his mother, who he hated. He said that he had no recollection of using a knife and subsequently retracted his confession. At the time, Peter was known to the police as someone who often made up stories. Having previously confessed to the crimes of the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, Nevertheless, on the 18th of October 1983, 21-year-old Peter was charged with the murder of Anne Lee and Margaret Johnson. The case went to trial at Winchester Crown Court on the 9th of July 1984 and lasted for 19 days. At trial, Peter protested his innocence, claiming that he had made up his confession in order to get attention. There was no forensic evidence linking him to the crime and the murder weapon had never been found. His defence team also showed that he was at the bank in Victoria Road, Aldershot, at the time of the murders, and as such could not have committed them. Additionally, in the week before the trial, Peter was assessed by a doctor who diagnosed him as a serial confessor. Peter did not testify. The prosecution argued that Peter had confessed to the crimes, having made 13 phone calls to the police, during which he named himself as the killer. In addition, they provided details of how he had been identified by several people from the photo fit that was circulated at the time of the crime. After deliberating for around 10 hours, spread over two days, the five men and seven women on the jury reached a majority verdict of 10 to 2. They found Peter guilty of both murders. On the 9th of August 1984, Peter was sentenced to life in prison. He continued to protest his innocence and appealed his conviction. This appeal was rejected in November 1985. Another 14 years passed before, in September 1999, his case was referred back to the Court of Appeal by the Criminal Cases Review Commission. During the hearing, Patrick O'Connor QC accused the police of putting Peter under extreme pressure when he was in a vulnerable state. Psychiatric evidence showed that Peter had a suggestible personality, was a fantasist and a serial confessor. On the 1st of December 2000, after spending 16 years in prison, Peter was released on bail after it was agreed that his conviction was unsafe. He had to remain at a bail hostel in London until the outcome of his appeal hearing. Three months later, on the 5th of March 2001, Peter was fully exonerated, becoming a free man. After his conviction was quashed, 
Peter said, if I dwell on it, it will just do me more harm, so I don't want to dwell on it. I'll just take one day at a time. I've always believed that one day I would be proved innocent. And when he was asked why he had confessed to the murders, he said, I used to say a lot of silly things, but did not realise they would be used against me at the trial. With Peter being fully exonerated, Margaret and Anne's killer has never been brought to justice. The case remains open, but will only be reinvestigated if new evidence comes to light, which, almost 30 years later, seems incredibly unlikely to happen. Peter is entitled to claim compensation for his ordeal, but I have been unable to find if this has been paid, and if so, how much he received. That concludes today's case. Please add any comments down below about the story. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. When Peter won his appeal, his team went to a London wine bar to celebrate. Peter's choice of drink was a cup of tea. It's what the English do. Goodbye. Yo! 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 Estamos por iniciar el juicio en su contra. Stay tuned now to hear about the Catman or El Hombre Gato. Gilad Sarusi Pereg was born on April the 16th, 1981, in Petah Tikva, Israel. Gilad preferred not to use his father's name, as their relationship was severely strained as his father walked out on them and abandoned Gilad alongside his mother, Piria Sarusi, and four siblings. Gilad, however, was very close with his grandfather, whom he came to view as his father figure, and so, when his grandfather passed away in 2006, the 25-year-old's behaviour began to change drastically, and he would be affected with a psychological disorder that was not fully diagnosed. Gilad was described as an intelligent man before his grandfather died, Having graduated from high school at 16, and by the time he was 24, he was an electronic engineer at the Technion, which is the Israeli Institute of Technology. But as mentioned soon after his grandfather passed away, his life began to go downhill, with rubbish piling up at his residence, and he was reported numerous times for antisocial behaviour, including harassment, indecent behaviour, and running around the campus naked. His academic studies would begin to suffer, and he also used to gamble, and his gambling debts would begin to pile up. Eventually, his family and the Israeli police decided that the time had come to institutionalise Gilad and give him the help that he needed. Israeli police reports indicated that he had suffered from paranoia, schizophrenia, as well as having committed numerous crimes such as harassment, indecent behaviour in public, destruction of property, violating court orders, and obstructing the police. But when he learned of this happening, he wasted no time in fleeing the country, and eventually arrived at his new home in Mendoza, Argentina, on December 15, 2007. Gilad would later claim to the authorities that he left Israel not because his family were about to admit him to a psychiatric hospital, but rather because the nation itself had betrayed or deceived him, and that they took his service at the front lines for granted. There were, however, no official records of Gilad having been involved in the military, and according to a relative, when the Israeli authorities came for Gilad's mandatory conscription, they deemed him unfit for service, despite a myriad of articles describing him as a former soldier. When he arrived in Argentina, his neighbours described his looks as that of a European model. However, he acted strangely, including only ever wearing the same outfit every single day. He also approached his neighbours once to ask if it bothered any of them if he was to install a CCTV camera for him to watch the street. Gilad would open up a deli and told his neighbours and anybody that asked that he was from Norway and that his name was Floda Relti, which is actually Adolf Hitler written backwards. He then provided fake passports and documentation to prove it. 
Gilad lived in a small dwelling that he had constructed himself and soon his appearance would transform as he stopped taking care of himself and would barely even eat, preferring to only consume vitamin compounds instead of food. His neighbours would soon describe him as a strange and lonely man who kept mostly to himself and had a foul odour to him. Some other nicknames that were given to him by his neighbours, who said that he had above average intelligence with an IQ of 180, and then described him as a con artist and a compulsive liar. Later on, he would drop the Floda Relti alias, and instead legally change his name to Nicholas Gil Hareg. The newly named Nicholas didn't think highly of his neighbours, accusing them of theft and drug trafficking on numerous occasions. In 2018, Nicholas would file a lawsuit against an architect whom he had commissioned to build a soccer and tennis court on his property back in 2010. He was claiming that he had been defrauded and that the situation led to immense emotional and psychological distress. As a consequence, he then argued that he was getting addicted to medication. He sought just under 2 million Argentine pesos in compensation, which is approximately $16,500 in today's money. In October 2018, he suddenly ended the lawsuit. He also had 20 businesses registered in his or his mother's name, which he used to write bad checks and would soon face lawsuits over unpaid taxes on his own property. Nicholas's property was valued at 270,000 Argentine pesos, which is about $2,300 in today's money. It would be raided on numerous occasions due to suspicions of arms trafficking and possession of restricted firearms. Despite all of his money, he willingly subjected himself to living in this way. The dwelling he lived in had no basic services such as water or electricity and was very unkempt with filth everywhere. The police during the various visits to his property seized $25,000, 15,000 euros, 3,000 Argentine pesos and an undisclosed number of Israeli shekels. But since he was unemployed, it's unknown where all of this money came from. He also had 40 firearms registered in his name, but very few were found at his house, and Nicholas never made any visits to a firing range to practice his shooting. Despite the money that he had made from his likely illegal activities and the deli that he owned, he lived on the brink of destitution and was actually 9 million pesos in debt. That's around $76,000. The police never found any toilet in his house, and instead, whenever Nicholas needed to urinate or defecate, he opted to do so on the same floor as the mattress which he slept on. He also had an abundance of pornographic magazines and DVDs in his possession. As he had no bathroom whenever he wanted to wash his face, he would trespass onto the nearby cemetery and use one of their taps to wash his hands. Very little is known about Nicholas's life in Argentina, but he would purchase more firearms and the highest amount of ammunition that he could legally own, and in 2018, he would write 46 bad checks, which is where this large 9 million peso debt came from. He is also rumoured to have filed a police report over the alleged theft of 11 of his firearms. The only legitimate money he seemed to have was money that his mother would wire to him as she worked for a collections agency back in Israel. On January the 11th, 2019, Nicholas's mother, Piria Sarusi, and aunt Lily Perig travelled to Argentina themselves to see Nicholas, with the two having not flown to Argentina since January 2011. This time the purpose of the visit was to resolve Nicholas's debt issues. Piria, as mentioned, worked for a collections agency, whilst Lily was a university professor and had both Israeli and Australian citizenship. Not a whole lot seems to be known about their meeting with Nicholas, but he did finally shave for the occasion and appeared much more presentable. The two sisters rented an apartment during their stay. Their relatives in Israel grew concerned when they had not heard back from them in a while. 
and soon Nicholas reported the two missing, stating that when he last saw them, they visited him at his home and he later escorted them to a bus back to their apartment. With pressure being asserted upon them by the Israeli and Australian governments, the Argentine authorities launched an extensive search operation to find the two sisters. The police checked their apartment and found all of their luggage in place and untouched, meaning that if they had left their apartment, they didn't intend to be out for very long. The police, however, did not believe that they ever made it back and were already suspicious of Nicholas. Part of the reason why they doubted his story was because CCTV cameras from a nearby cemetery showed the women walking in the area, but the camera footage never showed them leaving. The search for the two sisters would then be focused entirely around Nicholas's property. This was something that upset him greatly, and he started speaking to the media and accusing the neighbours of being behind the disappearances and stated that he lived in fear of leaving his home. He said, I've been robbed 50 times. They are Bolivians who make a mess here in the whole area and the police do nothing. I cannot leave my house because if I go out, they rob me. That was one quote that he gave to a journalist pointing towards his neighbours as he uttered it. He also explained his large abundance of firearms by saying that his neighbours would have killed him if he didn't have them for protection. He then said, Someone who may have come from Israel went after them to hurt them, or it may be someone who hates me here in the province, hurt them to take revenge on me. The police's visit to Nicholas's house over this matter revealed that not much had changed compared to their last visits, and that his property was still very much in a state of disarray. Only this time he had taken in a number of animals, having 37 pets on his property. Four of them were dogs, and 33 of them were cats. He likely had many more as the police, during their search of the property, found the bones of numerous cats buried beneath his land. He also stockpiled cat food and veterinary medicine, and his floor was stained with not only his own urine and feces, but also that of his animals. The police also found no food meant for human consumption in his home, indicating that he probably ate the cat food as well. Eventually, on January the 18th, police dogs were utilised in an attempt to find the sisters, and when they indicated human remains on Nicholas's property, he was arrested whilst search efforts intensified. On January the 26th, the bodies of Piria Sarusi and Lily Pereg were discovered in a well under a pile of stones. The police then conducted a full forensic examination of Nicholas's home, where they discovered three of the firearms that he had reported stolen, and also a t-shirt, a bag of cement, and cigarette butts stained with blood. DNA was extracted from this, and compared to a toothbrush at the lady's apartment. This ended up being a match, but it was unknown who owned the toothbrush, so it wasn't conclusive enough evidence. The police also interviewed a bus driver who recognised Nicholas and the sisters and testified that they were loudly arguing with one another in a foreign language likely to be Hebrew. Nicholas was charged with two counts of murders and when he heard the charges he said, if you don't let me go home to take care of my cats, you're going to find a body. Following this threat to himself, it led to him being isolated from the other inmates. He showed no signs of regret or sorrow over the news that the two were killed. Meanwhile, the bodies of the two ladies were examined, and it was determined that his aunt Lily had been shot three times with a revolver, while his mother, Piria, had been beaten to death with signs of a struggle and finally strangled with a lasso. They had also suffered post-mortem injuries, with both bodies being pierced with iron in various parts of their body. The police also found that Nicholas had booked a flight to Italy and he also had tickets booked in the name of four of his cats. This flight was however cancelled after he reported the sisters as missing. The prosecution argued that the murders were premeditated and that the motive was likely monetary in nature due to Nicholas's extensive debts. As mentioned, Nicholas was isolated and placed on suicide watch whilst numerous psychologists would visit and attempt to speak with him. Not long after, Nicholas went on a four-day hunger strike and refused to eat any food. 
The police, meanwhile, continued their investigation and learned that not long before the sisters arrived, Nicholas, in his dishevelled state, visited a gun store asking for a firearm after the police had confiscated his, with his reasoning being that he wanted it in case thieves broke into his home. It was during this time in isolation that Nicholas's behaviour and his mental state began to severely deteriorate and his strange habits and behaviour made themselves known. He demanded that ten of his cats be brought to his cell and that he be allowed to see his mother's body. These requests were denied as the bodies had already been sent back to Israel and it was stated that the cats would be a hygiene hazard. At the funeral service in Israel, relatives of the sisters stated that they did not hate Nicholas, stating that hatred would be unhealthy and not do them any good, and reiterated their belief that Nicholas was mentally unwell. The Argentine prosecutor, however, thought differently and deemed him of sound mind, and he was brought before a judge on February the 19th, 2019. The judge stated that Nicholas would behave very strangely and overreact to the simplest of questions. He stated that he didn't remember when he was born, identified himself as Floda Relti and referred to his 37 animals as his children. The first psychiatric report stated that he was a hostile, evasive, defiant, ironic and confrontational person, that he hides and manipulates information for profit whilst the only effective bond is with his pets. But he also believed that he was lucid and understood the legal ramifications of his actions. The prosecution and Nicholas's family requested that he be held in pretrial detention, but the defence argued that he be released but put on house arrest until the trial, stating that he wasn't a flight risk due to his relationship with his pets and that he wasn't safe in prison due to the other inmates expressing their desire to kill him. At one of the court hearings, events were postponed after Nicholas urinated himself, prompting the judge to have him removed. Before his removal, Nicholas had this to say, I don't care if I'm in jail or under house arrest, all I want is to be with my cats. If you want to send me home with 50 police officers to guard me, go ahead. I'm not interested in running away, I'm only interested in my cats. Nicholas was eventually kept in pre-trial detention with him having to be removed from the hearing as he kept making a non-stop meowing noise. He was isolated from the other inmates and wasn't there long before being put back on self-harming watch as he had threatened to take his own life if his cats were not delivered to his cell. Nicholas would often refuse to eat any food or drink any water, but he would accept milk and requested that he be given cat food or food meant for animals. He refused to shower or bathe. He would often take off his prison clothes and never use the toilet and would just urinate and defecate on his prison floor and could not be dissuaded from such behaviour. During the few times in which he was in contact with other inmates, on one such occasion, he defecated on the floor in front of a table where two other inmates were eating their lunch. Nicholas, just as the defence had feared, was attacked as another protective custody inmate stabbed him, although the injuries were not life-threatening. On another occasion, a group of inmates tried to break into his sector of the prison before riot control controlled the lynch mob. Soon the public would be able to witness his Nicholas actions in prison as a video was uploaded showing a naked Nicholas hissing, meowing and growling whilst attempting to claw at the guards once they opened the cell door. The purpose and context behind this video were the guards attempting to transfer him for a mental health evaluation. The next court hearing happened on March the 13th and Nicholas said to the judge, You may think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I see myself as a person, but I'm a cat. I have 37 children and I need to know how they are. He further requested that he be transferred from the prison and into a zoo. The judge would end this hearing by ordering that Nicholas undergo a second psychiatric evaluation and on March the 29th, he was transferred to a psychiatric hospital with this decision being in part motivated by Nicholas suddenly stripping naked in the middle of the hearing. Later, the issue of whether he could see his cats was finally put to rest once they were sent to an animal welfare organisation and then put up for adoption.
More updates would come in September when Nicholas threatened to kill himself in response to prison officials forcing him to bathe, with him stating that he'd purposefully avoid eating and to just let him die. It was further alleged that during this forced bathing, the guards handcuffed and beat him. In October, his mental health would become the focal point yet again when the National Assistance Programme for Persons with Disabilities in their relations with the Administration of Justice, or the NPPDRAJ, visited the prison and later made a report stating the inmate is not receiving the necessary sanitary conditions in accordance with his procedure and care in the prison complex where he is detained. They then made a recommendation that he be transferred to a psychiatric hospital. A psychologist was one of those who conducted the report and interviewed Nicholas on September the 19th. This psychologist expressed the belief that he thought he was insane. The next court hearing was on February the 12th, 2020, and Nicholas had to be expelled from the court due to continuous meowing. His defence continued to argue that he was mentally incompetent, citing a previous history of mental illness in Israel and the NPP DRAJ report from September, whilst the prosecution argued against this citing the psychologist in Argentina who deemed him sane and how he didn't display any of this behaviour before his arrest. The judge at this hearing ruled that he has a personality disorder, but it is not proven that he is delusional. Nicholas, during this hearing, had the long thick beard that he had before the murders and wore the same white shirt he wore during the first hearing, which had now become stained brown. The case was continued to an unknown date later in 2020. His trial never occurred in 2020 due to COVID-19. However, he was admitted to a mental hospital for another evaluation in May, and the staff at the hospital claimed that he responded well to treatment. The trial date was set for October the 26th, 2021, and it was going to be broadcast live, not just in Argentina, but also in Israel and Australia, among other countries, with the audio being dubbed from Spanish into Hebrew and English respectively. Whilst in the hospital, he would refuse to shave, bathe or change his clothes and started losing muscle mass. During his first days in the hospital, the only things he would consume were eight litres of milk. October the 26th came and the trial would finally begin and it got off to a sensational start as numerous people watched as Nicholas, live on camera, would make a continuous meowing noise before being removed from the courtroom after refusing to stop or answer the judge and prosecutor's questions. When the judge asked, Mr. Gil Pereg, is this your name? He simply went, meow. Before entering, I warned you to be quiet, otherwise you will have to be removed to an adjoining room. Nicholas again went, meow. Various witnesses would be called, including a father and son that owned a mechanical workshop, with the two stating that they heard the sounds of gunfire and two women screaming. His neighbours were also called to testify, and they explained that they never observed him acting as if he was a cat prior to the murders. The owners of various gun and firearm stores were also questioned, and stated that whenever he went to purchase weapons from them, they said that although he did act strangely, appear rather unkempt, and paid only in cash with money held in a nylon bag, they testified that he never came off as insane to them. The next people called to the stand were the psychiatrists who examined him, saying his ways of living were not compatible with those of the rest of the population in his pavilion, and this put him at risk. He wrote symbols with his own excrement on the walls and did not clean himself. Another stated, in principle, I remember that he was diagnosed with a schizotypal personality disorder a way of being that makes him a person isolated from the natural environment with differential characteristics, extravagance and difficulties in social exchange. Another called by the prosecution said he was vigilant, lucid and able to communicate, before adding, we did not detect alterations at the level of thought, nor delusions or hallucinations. Then, the last one stated, we evaluated him with a team of professionals, with interviews that lasted from two to four hours, because he detailed and recounted a lot. 
From the first day, no alterations in his judgment were observed or detected that would prevent him from distinguishing good from bad or directing his actions. The defence team, however, countered this by producing his medical history from Israel, where he was known to have a long history of mental illness, and even called another psychiatrist from Argentina who disputed the findings of those called by the prosecution. This psychiatrist diagnosed Nicholas with paraphrenia and stated that he feels that he is a cat, he has a delusion and a thought disorder that on certain occasions he clearly uses to exaggerate or accentuate it in exchange for a benefit. It is a pathology in which critical judgment is altered, but in others it remains preserved. Nicholas was later permitted to speak at the trial where he denied killing anyone and said that his mother was still alive and visited him every night with him saying the following. When they arrested me, they supposedly found the bodies. In the raids they found nothing. They have kidnapped my mother and my aunt. My mother sees me every night and talks to me. She tells me that she is kidnapped and asks me to go save her. Nicholas would also explain his background stating, For a limited time I can be like a two-legged creature and be like humans, but in my house I lived 100% like a cat. When I put the mask on my face and act like a person, it was very difficult for me. It could be like this for five or six hours. I have lived in a closed bubble. After I opened my eyes at the university, I went to the army. I saw how bad they do it and I couldn't stand it. I spent eight months locked up in the room of the house until I decided to become a cat. I was walking naked on the street and marking my territory. I lost control of my body so I talked to my mother and decided to escape. He explained that when he arrived in Argentina he had a group of two-legged creatures who helped him because he was alone and then ended his statement by stating how he didn't desire to live in this world. I'm paranoid. I can't accept this world because it's so ugly. I don't want to know anything. On November the 3rd, 2021, after two hours of deliberation, a jury unanimously found Nicholas capable of understanding the criminality of his actions and they reached a guilty verdict. He was soon after sentenced to life imprisonment with release to be considered after 35 years. Despite the sentence, however, Nicholas is not currently in prison and instead resides in a mental hospital as he has not been deemed safe or competent to be sent to prison yet due to his behaviours. The last update was on May 8th, 2022, which describes his life at the hospital. Due to his continued refusal to bathe, he had developed thrombosis, phlebitis and a severe lice infection. Nicholas as of late hasn't been meowing but he still displays other cat-like behaviours such as refusing to bathe and sleeping in a ball. He has been described as fairly docile and heavily medicated and sedated at times. His attorneys intend on appealing the verdict and eventually have Nicholas declared criminally insane. One other video that I found included just before Nicholas was arrested. This included footage of a man remonstrating with Pereg and he broke into English to leave a very clear message. The murderer of your mother, of his mother, this will be on your grave. Thanks for listening to this case. Please add any comments down below and please like and subscribe if you are new to the channel. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye.